educators refer to the physical environment as a third teacher, which is a great phrase because it evokes the role that good space plays in program quality. Massachusetts has some very ambitious programs for our children. The Quality Rating and Improvement System, the Governor's Act to Reduce the Achievement Gap, the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, and a number of other programs that all focus on improving academic outcomes for children particularly high-needs children. These efforts are more likely to succeed if we move the programs out of windowless classrooms with poor air quality, abysmal acoustics, and into spaces that are well-equipped, well-designed, and that really support teaching and learning. Windows and daylighting, it, it's interesting because one of the things I was most surprised to find out about was that the International Building Code actually has specifications for habitable space uh, and that habitable space must have windows. Now it's fairly minimal. Window space should be equivalent to approximately 8% of the floor space or better. And we have walked into childcare programs that have no natural light. Light and exposure to natural light uh, and the reverse of that exposure to artificial lights, particularly fluorescent lights, have an impact on their learning experiences. We don't even need large-scale research studies to show this, but when any of us are in spaces that are hot and where there are a lot of people, you know, we, we know the CO2 is going up, we know people get tired. The same things are happening in early care and education programs. I'm sure if more research were focused in this area, we would find that the indoor air quality to be a direct culprit of challenging behaviors and also some of the health issues that um, are associated with being in childcare. Massachusetts has very high asthma rates, particularly among low-income children. In our study, we found that 22 percent of the classrooms across the state had poor indoor air quality. And we also found that 36% of those programs didn't even have mechanical ventilation. So let's think about acoustics. It's a common sense question. I have difficulty hearing across a room in an early care and education program. I can't imagine a child who is trying to piece together and make sense out of, uh, out of oral language is able to do so in a lot of those environments. The other thing too that I think is interesting and has not been explored, but teachers often have to really raise their voice to be heard by the group. And yeah, sometimes it sounds like yelling. What, what is it like for children to be in environments where they feel like they're being yelled at all day? And it may be simply a byproduct of the fact that you really have to raise your voice to get above the din in the room. I don't think we can underestimate how important environments are to workers. As we're increasing the professional development of the workforce, what is the motivation going to be to stay in many of these environments that are frankly depressing, uncomfortable, and really don't allow teachers to do what they know they should be doing or could be doing. I mean, you know, even a really great teacher is going to have to manage behavioral issues if the environment is not promoting children's independence and competence or engaging their interest. And so I think a lot of people, as they increase their qualifications, are going to get out of those environments as quickly as they can. Long-term solution, I really, you know, it, it's easy to say this, and I know it's much harder to do, but this is a public financing issue. Early care and education programs are so undercapitalized, they can't even afford to pay their staff a decent wage. There is no way that they, on their own, could develop and pay for the infrastructure that would really lay the foundation for a really high quality early care and education sector in any community that I can think of. One of the biggest lessons I've taken from the research I've done in the last five years is that our notions of quality and quality early care and education experiences is just too narrow. It really needs to encompass these, these other 
aspects of the learning environment and how people experience the learning environment, the impact's a lot larger than we probably even right. think about what happens to children who spend 10 hours a day, five days a week, you know, 50 plus weeks a year in these kind of environments starting at a very young age, um, what the consequences are for their development. One thing that's clear is when I walk into programs now I, and I see the condition of facilities, it says a lot to me about what we as a society think about early care and education and how much we value children and how much we value the workforce. And it would not be a surprise to me if the children who are in those programs, as well as the workforce that works in those programs, is also either consciously or unconsciously getting messages that they're not valued.